This video is a kind of part two to last week's video on horseshoe theory. It's about what radical means, as opposed to how it's used in the media. Nowadays, when someone turns violent for apparently the first time, journalists scour their social media for evidence of how they became radicalized. However convenient the term radicalization might be, it's usually used inaccurately. If your ideology leads you to kill people for their race or gender, you're not radical. You're a reactionary. The difference is, radicals work towards liberation. Reactionaries reinforce the power structure. So where did this term radicalization come from, and what do radicals actually do? Well, let's find out. I'm Chris, and this is what had to be said. But first, support this channel by buying some pills! Now that Alex Jones has been exposed as a scam artist, who knew? You'll want to get your superpower supplements from someone more trustworthy, like me, a different guy on the internet. There's the muscle pill, the boner pill, the unnecessary vitamins pill. You'll be virile like me and Alex in no time. Imagine when you're born, you're, you begin driving down this highway called knowledge. There are lots of things to see from the highway, so you don't pick up everything, but you observe and take things in, and that's how you learn about the world. When you reach adolescence, you're still driving, but you start seeing off-ramps. Some people just keep driving, always learning more, not satisfied with big answers that attempt to explain everything, but others are intrigued by the off-ramps. Some people take an early exit from knowledge, to a simple answer. They read that the Jews, whoever they are, are responsible for all the bad things in the world, even contradictory stuff like owning all the banks and funding communist movements. Once you're off the highway of knowledge, you've got your answer. So you don't try very hard to look for others. So it's the Jews. And from the same people you learn about how black and trans people are evil and bringing down things you were taught to believe in as a child like our country. So they're the problem, too. You're never the problem. Just groups you don't belong to. But these people got off the highway too early. If they had kept driving, i.e. learning, they might have read books about how anti-Semites and white supremacists have been using this kind of myth for centuries to stir up violence and protect their own power. Some people don't learn about that, but they still don't take that off-ramp. They keep driving until there's another off-ramp, and they think this one must be there. On this off-ramp, vaccines are a government plot to enslave us. I think you get the metaphor, anyway. People who take these off-ramps then consume a huge amount of media reinforcing the same lies. They, they often become willing to take measures beyond the officially sanctioned to achieve or restore some situation they've learned to believe is the correct way to be. It might be an image of how things were, or it might be a personal crusade against something they've learned to see as evil, like vaccines or transgender people. When someone gets brainwashed by people online to believe this or that group or series of groups is the problem, and that the obvious solution is to kill or imprison them all, they get called a radical. The media talks about their radicalization, meaning the path they took to reach the point where they're champing at the bit to see their political enemies suffer at any cost. The problem is, it's not radicalization, because these people aren't radicals. They're reactionaries. Let's talk history, specifically the history of the word radicalization. 
After the end of the Cold War, the U.S. and its allies lost the USSR and the so-called communist world as their enemies. As you might know if you're on this channel, all states need enemies to distract their subjects from what the local rulers are actually doing. There were a few terrorist attacks in the U.S. over the 1990s, but none of them were particularly high profile, with the exception maybe of the Oklahoma City bombing in 1995. Then, in 2001, Al-Qaeda sent the U.S. a gift wrapped in gold, the 9-11 attacks on the World Trade Center. The attackers were Muslims. Overnight, Muslims became the enemy. Violence against brown people went through the roof. A cottage industry of self-dubbed experts on Islam and Muslims and extremism and terrorism and counter-terrorism appeared out of nowhere. The right wing seized on the trend to expand its bigotry so more liberal types would get sucked into their fear of the other. And the FBI used it all as an excuse to appear relevant. In the US and UK especially, police treated Muslims with suspicion. MI5 soon developed a classification system for Muslims where some were labeled moderate Muslims while others were labeled radical Muslims. If there's anyone labeled a radical Muslim near you, you have been surveilled and spied on. Unsurprisingly, the media were happy to take on the new security jargon and give interviews to everyone calling themselves counter-terrorism experts, and soon everybody was saying radicalization. The FBI and other punishment enforcement agencies wanted to take the gloves off and have full reign to do anything they wanted to suspects, and the government empowered them accordingly. The FBI blatantly used wiretapping and entrapment to secure convictions. And by the way, I'm not putting links about FBI entrapment in the description solely because if you Google it yourself, you'll find about a thousand examples. Naturally, the FBI and the other agencies claim they're trying to prevent violence, but the people they target often have no evidence of violence or conspiracy to commit violence, so the authorities have to concoct some bogus charge. A lot of the people charged were just radical and extreme, saying things like, the U.S. is an empire that needs to be stopped before millions more people are killed. Sounds pretty uncontroversial to me. The Bush and Obama administrations used the threat of terrorism, extremism, and ismism, that's the one to really watch out for, by the way, ismism, as an excuse to expand the power of the national security state. They killed Anwar al-Awlaki with drones on the other side of the world because apparently he was radicalizing Muslims over the internet. A few weeks later, the same president used a different drone to kill Anwar's son, Abdul Rahman, and at least six more civilians. A senior advisor to Obama said Abdul Rahman should have had a more responsible father. The people in power have no interest in learning why someone would oppose their supremacy, but maybe there were good reasons? We say they were radicalized, and just leave it there. Why? How? Well, it's not that difficult to understand if your head isn't clogged with ideology. States are extremely powerful. They impose their will on everyone in their jurisdiction by force. If they're doing things that hurt the people around you, you might want to fight back. The U.S. is the military wing of a global empire that props up other states around the world, so it's an obvious target. It never stops, never slows down, just keeps killing and imprisoning and installing dictatorships and opening countries up for huge corporations to take their resources. Wouldn't you be mad? The word radicalization started as an MI5 ploy to demonize Muslims and separate the radicals from the rest. More recently, as Muslims have faded from the headlines, the term has been used with right-wingers because of 
J6, the January 6th riots at the Capitol building, and maybe because of all the other wild things Trump supporters are getting up to. In both cases, they're wrong. People who want to install a different kind of dictatorship are reactionaries, not radicals. This video accompanies the video on horseshoe theory because if you pay no attention to what different groups do, what they believe, and how they reach their supposedly extreme thinking, if they all get lumped together as radicals, they seem the same. And horseshoe theory seems obviously true. And maybe to the FBI they are all the same. But I think we're capable of a bit more nuance than the FBI. If you look at official definitions of radicalization, you might notice they're heavy on the word extreme without defining it. That's so the state can use the word to demonize people who dissent from this system of violence and can make up the specifics of what to arrest them for later. In another video, I said the word extreme means nothing in an age of extremes. Using words like extremism and radicalization serves above all to keep everyone who falls out of the officially accepted ways of thinking from straying too far, and giving the state an excuse to do whatever it wants to the people they decide are bad. You're not allowed to take a radical approach to solving problems like blowing up pipelines, occupying public space, or stealing from the rich, even though a radical approach is the only one with any chance of working. The alternative is to work through the system, which mostly results in being told to wait. By the way, I'm not actually proposing like an alternative word here to radicalize. You know, maybe reactionarization might be accurate for people becoming reactionaries, but something tells me it's not about to catch on. I just think it's important to recognize media language for what it is. Reactionaries sometimes use the rhetoric of radicals, like the language of abolition, but they don't actually mean it. Sometimes you don't need to press them. They contradict themselves in the same post. In response to Donald Trump's Mar-a-Lago home being raided by the FBI this week, Right-wingers were falling all over each other to say we should defund or abolish the FBI. But they don't believe that. They mean they want an FBI that only pursues leftists. This tweet probably encapsulates it pretty well. Especially the quote from Frank Wilhoit, I think it's pronounced. Conservatism consists of exactly one proposition. There must be in-groups whom the law protects but does not bind, alongside out-groups whom the law binds but does not protect. One of those out-groups is criminals. Everyone the police investigate and arrest, except right-wingers, who are just the target of political machinations, because they are not criminals, even if they broke the law. They're good people and patriots. They always tell us, if we don't break the law, we have nothing to worry about, which is, of course, reactionary nonsense to justify everything the police do. Everyone breaks the law, whether they realize it or not. And if their god Trump is under fire, it must be the end of the Republic and possibly even Western civilization. All of a sudden, the wrong people are being targeted by law enforcement. It must be the result of wokeness or one of those other vague evils. The people who ordered the raid on Mar-a-Lago must be commies. But Dinesh D'Souza wins this week's prize for most contradictory tweet, as he has so many times before. We're going to abolish the FBI and then rebuild and fill it with our own people. Oh, so not abolish it? Just give control to the Republican Party? See? Reactionary. The radical approach is to actually abolish the FBI. 
along with the police and other levels of state security, and let people organize for their own defense and well-being. Reactionaries still want concentrated means of violence they can use against their enemies. They just get self-righteous when anyone uses it on them. Like the language of abolition, right-wingers will use any rhetoric they can take and repurpose. You hear them claim to care about the workers who are oppressed by the elite. But there's a huge difference between the left and right approaches to this issue. As I said in my last video, these things depend on the person and what you call left and right. But to the extent we can speak generally, the left wants to set workers free. Anarchists and some Marxists want them to organize and free themselves, while the more paternalistic types might want to do it for them. The right wants to organize the workers so they help usher in a new kind of fascist authoritarianism. When they talk about the elite, they mean Jews. It's just another dog whistle for them. They still believe in authority and hierarchy and violence to establish it and violence to uphold it. They just want a different elite. Reactionaries often think of themselves as rebels and therefore radicals because they're vehemently opposed to changes that would make life easier for anyone but themselves. And when they see changes like trans people being more accepted, they say they're rebels and radicals for opposing it. Same with opposing the current government. They try to look like rebels because they oppose the current government, when what they want is a far more oppressive government you can't rebel against. It doesn't matter what's popular. You're not cool just because you're a contrarian. What matters is if you support people's freedom. And when I say people, I mean all people, especially the freedom of the most oppressed among us, the least of my brothers, as Jesus might have said. Freedom is always opposed to the system. Trying to force people back into the closet or assimilate with an oppressive culture or just downplaying their suffering supports the system. It makes it easier to victimize people because it means less solidarity with the victimized. Even leftists can be reactionaries. Leftist reactionaries say things like, trans people are only 1% of the population. So it doesn't matter if we have their support. Well, what's the point of organizing at all if it isn't for the most oppressed people? Leftist reactionaries are afraid of decolonizing because they think natives can't be trusted to manage their ancestral homeland. Like the right, these people like the aesthetic of opposition and revolution while actually undermining it. There's nothing radical about a political party that sucks money, attention, effort, and hope out of the community, and has no chance of winning anything. Your flags and berets do nothing. Let me tell you a true story about radicalization. I was on the highway of knowledge. I was learning about the world, partly reading books and partly on social media, learning from a million people. At first, I was just reading books about how the system worked, then I got introduced to anarchism, and things took off. I realized the value of freedom as a guiding principle and goal. I realized most people talking about freedom were just offering a different justification for oppression. I realized the urgency of freedom in a world where people are persecuted for being black, brown, native, gay, or trans, and where all kinds of other people were marginalized and subjected to violence like disabled people, the mentally ill, the poor, and anyone protesting the police. The people I followed on social media kept painting a picture of a world I hadn't seen firsthand. I questioned it all, sure, but I couldn't explain away anything they said without acting in bad faith. I nodded. I agreed. And through more reading and more listening to people, I realized these systems exist to oppress and concentrate power over the oppressed. And the best thing we could do is abolish them. That's a radical idea. Giving them more power is a reactionary idea. So what do radicals do? 
They set up mutual aid arrangements to feed and clothe and house the poor, to protect people from losing their homes, to protect people from police, border patrol, and right-wing militias. They work on land back efforts and decolonization. They target the infrastructure fueling climate change, like pipelines. They educate people. Learn more about mutual aid and direct action, what they are, what's been done before, and what's being done now. Or at least that's what radicals would like to do. There isn't always time for that because they also have to defend the most basic of freedoms and their lives from the right wing. I feel like I can never emphasize enough how dangerous the right wing is. At the moment, it's drastically ramping up its anti-queer propaganda, labeling every queer person existing in public a groomer, which implies pedophile, in case you didn't know, giving them justification to kill. They're openly talking about reducing the number of queer people. They're trying to legislate trans people out of existence and kill anyone who doesn't conform. I can't say this enough. They're proposing a genocide of queer people. There's no two sides to this. They've laid the groundwork, dehumanizing them, legislation against them, training cops to fear them. The next step is mass murder. They've been widely attempting the same thing with black, brown, and Asian people, who so far have been the biggest victims of these mass shootings. If you don't remember anything else from this video, please understand this part. The right is building up to kill people en masse, and the police will not stop them. There's no left equivalent to that. Your jokes and satire and debates will not stop them. Please find guns and friends and community support and anything to prevent them carrying out their plans. Be a radical. Destroy the reactionary.